starboard battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Flint stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's indomitable man of the sea, Horatio Hornblower. No sooner had Captain Bush presented himself, Baltic charts in hand, than I vented my ill temper on him. But I ask for charts and you bring me these. Captain Bush, what good are charts in three different languages? Now look here, French charts, one in German, another Swedish. How can we possibly decide where or how to strike against Bonaparte when even the charts don't agree with one another? They're the best we've got aboard the nuns, that's so. Look, even their soundings. Look, this one's in Swedish feet and the French use their new metric system and... Right, for those confounded Germans, oh, Lord knows what they use. I know, it's very annoying. Of course, we could have your clerk, Sorga, translate them for us. Sorga? Yeah. How is he now? He's lost a deal of blood. He'll never use that right hand of his again, not after you were forced to slash his wrist with your sword, sir. But we can make use of him and, until we hang him. Hang him, yes. Yes, I'm afraid we'll have to. Humorless idiot. Attempting to assassinate Tsar Alexander himself. He came within a hair's breadth of succeeding. Yes. A cocked pistol in his hand, hiding behind a pillar in the Tsar's palace. Well, what could I do but slash his wrist? I should never have let him accompany us to the palace. The man's a fin. It was Russia that despoiled his country. Uh, I should have realized he was dangerous. It's over and done with, sir. Thanks to you, the Russians are now ready to defy Bonaparte. Defy him? Hmm. Possibly. They've taken up no arms against him yet, as you will notice. And meanwhile, we are idle. Now, surely... Surely there's some place in the Baltic we can strike a blow against Bonaparte. Uh, for example, there. Well, the, the fish is half, sir. Now, why not? As you see, it's a long, narrow lagoon between Elbing and Königsberg in East Prussia. Now, Boney has a tremendous force in East Prussia, and, and how else can he supply them except by water? The fisher's half runs from the Polish River straight eastward, 50 miles long and a dozen miles wide. Communications and supply, Bush. It'll be a shrewd blow. Yes, sir, but... <laughs> well, sir... Come on out with it, Bush. Well, beg your pardon, sir. It's impossible. Impossible? Mm -hmm. The half is separated from the Baltic Sea by that long sand spit. There's but one entrance from the Baltic. No need to tell me what I already know. One entrance. Yes, and that one directly under the guns of the French. Well, I suppose you consider it impossible for this squadron to attack French shipping in the half. I hesitate to say, sir, but... Well, then don't, if you'll oblige me. Set course for the fish's half, Captain Bush. It's much too good a target to be impossible. Yes, sir. Come, come, Bush. There's more ways than one to skin a cat. And, and we will have Sorga translate these charts for us. That was a good suggestion of yours. <laughs> Sorga lay in sick bay, pale and wan from loss of blood. He presented another problem, one that made me angry and faintly sympathetic both at once. 
Well, Sorger, better? I believe so. You're an idiot. You realize what you're in for. By the Articles of War and the laws of England, you're going to die for your foolishness. I am not English. I am a Finn. You fled from Finland. You took service in the British Navy. I would do it all over again. Our enemy is Bonaparte, not Russia. I repeat, I would do it all over again. I am homeless. What is my country now? A slave, helpless under the heel of Russia. One day I am the richest man in Finland... And the next, the poorest man in England. There's but one question here, Sorga, whether you can legally face court-martial here at sea or whether you must be sent back to England for it. In either case, I am as good as dead. Yes. Bush, I'll trouble you for those charts, huh? Yes, sir. Mr. Sorga, I want these charts checked with particular attention to the Frisher's half. The half? So, Horatio, that's impregnable to attack from the board. It will be good enough to leave the decisions to me, Mr. Sorgan. Oh. Where's the ship's doctor? Your wound must trouble you very much. Perhaps he can ease the pain. Oh, no, no, it is nothing. According to the Swedish map, the freshest half is three or four fathoms deep at most. And here is Fort Pilar above the end. <laughs> studied the problem, the more impossible it seemed. I was a fool. And yet, so stubborn a fool that several nights later I found myself tossing up and down in the stern of a cutter. With Lieutenant Vickery of our sloop Lotus, I was being rowed in to inspect the single entrance to the Trish's hut under the guns of Fort Pilau. Uh, there, easy. Yeah. Warm night, sir. A dark night, Mr. Vickery. Thank God. Do you think the French is nowhere about this? No, no. We came up after dark and hove to. The entrance will be blocked with floating logs chained together, Mr. Vickery. Keep a sharp eye out for them. Aye, aye sir. The gunboat, of sir. They'll be patrolling the blockade. White water, sir. White water. The blockade, sir. Rest doors will drift onto it. Rest doors. Rest doors. There it is, sir. Down first, if you please, Mr. Vickery. All right, sir. Hamilton, bring her about. About it, yes, sir. Good. Now, I will hold my cape, Mr. Vickery. Sir, you're not going to walk that lodge, sir. Why not? The way the washing half over, Mr. Vickery. Get the skin and walk her slippery. Oh, you you make a wonder. Take my cape, Mr. Vickery. All right, sir. Standing off and on, out of sight of the Frenchies, since you came aboard last night, sir. It it went poorly, sir. No worse than I expected, Bush. Could the nun such ram through that blockade, sir? Well, logs the size of tree trunks and all connected by heavy cable. Impossible, Bush. Hmm. Horatio, you thought of the way out, haven't you? I'd be obliged if you'd make signal to the, to the squadron, Captain Bush. All commanding officers are to report to my cabin this afternoon at six bells. You've solved the problem, sir. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, that's the plan of action. It's going to be difficult, but with luck, we might just, just pull it off. It's an incredible plan, sir. There's no one to think of this except you. <clears throat> yeah, I presume it's clear. Four boats will go in past the blockade tonight. There's open water at the Sandspit side. Make a record, Mr. Montgomery. The Nansuch launch and cutter, the cutters from Lotus and Raven. Aye, aye, sir. A four-pounder in the eye of the launch, three-pounders in the cutters. Food, water, ammunition, combustibles for setting captured vessels on fire. Aye, aye, sir. Now, um, <clears throat> as to who shall command the raiding party? Yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes Mr. Go. Yes. If it's to be by order of seniority, uh, I am the senior officer, sir. You are, Mr. Go. But the first task shall be to penetrate the lagoon. And since Mr. Vickery went in with me to inspect it, he's certain to know more about the situation. It shall be Mr. Vickery. Sorry, Mr. Go. Difficult.
difficulty that I looked at Cole during the rest of the conference. There had been no harm in soothing his feelings with an excuse like that. Yet the fact of the matter was, I dared not trust him with any command out of my sight. He was old, gray-haired, bowed, almost too old for the work he already had. Oh, well, no war can be fought without hurting someone's feelings. At nightfall, the squadron stood in toward the land. There's no moon, sir. There's every chance they'll slip through the blockade unobserved. Yes, Bush. Let's pray the rest of it will be as easy. I am praying. I've risked the lives of 150 men, sent them into the jaws of a trap. And if I'm wrong about how to fetch them out again safely... It's bound to work, sir. It's risky, but it'll work. I'm certain before, but now I have serious doubts. Cutters? No. Gunboats putting out from the port pilot to stand a guard over the entrance. <laughs> Must have given them a turn to open their eyes and see British ships standing off just beyond cannon range. They may already have known about us. They may have captured the raiding party and all our plans are for naught. Ahoy, the lookout! Any sign? No sign, sir. Here's Lieutenant Mound come aboard. Off his bomb kit, sir. Bush, I have eyes. Do oh, I? I wish mine were as good as our lookout. Lieutenant Mound reporting, sir. Good morning, Mound. We you your bomb kits ready for your part in this venture? Yes, sir. Hmm. Uh, you understand what must be done? My bomb kit will proceed out of sight of the Frenches and go wide of that long sand spit that separates the Frisch's house from the sea proper. Mm -hmm. Then I'm to turn in on the seaward side of it. At a point 12 miles to westward, Mr. Mound. Yes, sir. And there will be there at uh, precisely 2 a.m., four bells. Water is shallow, there may be surf. Um, look, Mr. Mound, I think I shall go with you. You, sir? Yes, I enjoyed my last outing on a bomb catch, and I might find this extremely... Ahoy, the deck! He spotted something. All in the what do you see? If you please, sir, there's a bit of smoke in sight now. It's well up in the bay. Smoke, by heaven, what? There's more smoke, sir. Two ships on fire. Sir, I can see our captain. Victory! He's got out of Fisher's hut. Well, Captain Bush. So far, so good, eh? The day wore on, and far as lookouts I could see, pillars of smoke were rising in the fish's hut, marking the destruction wrought by Vickery and his cutters. Towards the middle of the afternoon, before it came time to go aboard the bomb catch with Mound, I ordered a diversionary attack. I wanted the defenders to think twice before they put all their efforts against Vickery. We're dropping down within range of Fort Pillow now, sir. So long as we draw their fire, Captain Bush. They're opening up. We shall do the same, Mr. Please, Captain. Gunbeck, fire when ready. Fire, sir. Ready. Port battery. Fire! Mr. Mound? Yes, sir. Been waiting all day, eh? Yes, sir. Well, so have I. We'll put off for the bomb catch now, if you please. <laughs> All hands present, Mr. Vickery? Yes, sir. Two wounded, but not badly. We destroyed and burned a number of crafts, sir, coasters and barges. Two thousand pounds of shipping altogether. What are those fires? Have you burned your own cutters? We had to abandon them on the far side of the spit of sand. Why? I hated to have them fall into enemy hands. What do you mean? We may not get away scot free, sir. When we came up on the other side of the sand spit, we flushed a patrol, three men. We took care of two of them, but one got away. By now, he's probably spread the alarm. I see. I knew there must be some good reason why you burned the boats. No, yes, sir. With an alarm already spread, the fire could warn them no faster. Mr. Mound? Yes, sir. It's imperative that the men be passed on board as quickly as possible. In a matter of minutes, the enemy will go down on us like hornets, possibly a full company. And have them watch the undertow. If they must get rid of cutlasses and anything else that might weigh them down, have them do so. All must be taken aboard. I'll not have one man lost. <laughs> well organized. The blaze from the burning cutters began to die down, but still it lit the tumbling surf with orange and scarlet. Mound had gone back on board the catch to supervise matters. The thing went well. The men clambered aboard or, or were dragged helter-skelter, and finally the beach was clear, except for Vickery and me. You're just in time, sir. 
want the torches over there in the direction of the fort? I doubt if they're fireflies, Mr. Vickery. Into a sir, if you please. I'll see you, sir. Thank you, Vickery, but the senior officer is always allowed the last to leave a post of danger. Aye, aye, sir. Well, it was the most welcome relief when the catch loomed up ahead and strong arms dragged me aboard, with no more ceremony than if I were a waterlogged castaway instead of a Lord Commodore. Up you come, sir. Steady there. Now, there you are. Uh, are you all right, sir? Oh, of course I'm all right. Oh, that's the Commodore for you. And why shouldn't he be? Him that bathes in salt water most every morning. Silence, sir. Sir, we're fast to ground. Uh, what's that? In the sand, sir. We've taken aboard 150 men. The catch must have gone down a full foot. Good Lord, Martin. Well, his men will be on us in a matter of minutes. We'll be sitting down. If you please, Mr. Vickery. Mr. Martin, have you tried to catch us off with the anchor? Two anchors, sir. There aren't a storm, and we've bent to the windlass till the cable sings, but we're still fast. Sir, if half the men would go over the side and hang on to ropes, it would lighten ship. Have one or more of them miss his grip and drown? No, Vickery. I said I wouldn't lose a man, and I won't. At least, not that way. They've spotted us. It's a full company, at least. It came to me then. One possible way to shake ourselves loose from the deadly grip of the sand that held us prisoned. Yet I, I hesitated for a moment, hoping that Mount himself would see the solution, not have it come from me. And even while I hesitated, he'd found it. Sir, we can rock the boat. A hundred and fifty men, we can have them run from port to starboard and back again. Exactly, Mount, by all means. All hands to starboard! All hands! They're firing random shots at us. If you could tell off ten men here in the bow with small arms to answer their fire. Yes, sir. Crew of launch, none such. Crew of launch, none such. This way to the bow. Small arms. We'll keep the Frenchies busy while we rock the ship. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. 
produced by Harry Allen Towers.